After we posted the video about the SBB situation, a lot of you guys asked us to make a follow-up on how banks actually work. So here it is. Now, before we get into the video as a company that is safe and healthy, we're bootstrapped, which means we started this from the ground up with no investor money other than our own resources. We've got enough cash flow to cover any type of crisis, and the SBB situation was really business as usual. Also, we are not investors in SBB, but depositors. Now, if you don't know the difference between those two terms, you'll especially benefit from watching this video. So here's how banks work. Welcome to a lot. So let's start off with a brief history and timeline of banking because this wouldn't be a complete video without some historical background. Now, it's important to understand where everything began. So here is the timeline. Ancient banking between 2000 BC to 100 CE The history of banking is almost as old as humanity itself. The first recorded evidence of banking activity dates back to ancient Mesopotamia, where merchants provided grain loans to farmers and traders, temples, and palaces. In Babylon, Egypt, and Greece served as repositories for valuables and issued loans to citizens. One of the most famous legal codes from ancient Mesopotamia, the Code of Hammurabi, contains several laws related to financial transactions, property rights, and commercial activities. These laws provide insights into sophisticated financial systems and regulations. So, yes, our ancestors were not as stupid as we like to believe. Banking in Rome from 100 BC to about 500 CE Roman banks, known as Mansur, was involved in currency exchange, deposit-taking, and lending. Individuals known as Argentine bankers or money changers and foreign editors raised money. Lenders played a significant role in the financial system. This provided various financial services, such as money-changing lending and deposit-taking. And these individuals often set up their businesses in the Forum, the center of commercial and political life in ancient Roman cities. Medieval banking from 500 CE to about 1400 CE. After the fall of the Roman Empire, banking activity decreased in Western Europe but continued in the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world. The Knights Templar, a Christian military order, established an early form of international banking, allowing pilgrims to deposit and withdraw funds across their network of commentaries. The rise of modern banking from 1400 C to 1700 C. The Medici family, an influential banking dynasty in Renaissance Italy, developed the double-entry bookkeeping system. So this period saw the establishment of central banks such as the Bank of Amsterdam in 1609, the Swedish Reichsbank in 1668, and the Bank of England in 1694, which provided stability and regulation to banking systems. Central banks began to issue banknotes and manage the money supply. The 20th century, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the gold standard became the dominant global monetary system. Participating countries pegged their currencies to gold, facilitating international trade and investment. The gold standard provided stability but restrict countries' abilities to manage economic fluctuations leading to its eventual collapse during the Great Depression. And this led to the creation of regulatory bodies and insurance schemes to protect depositors. The latter half of the century saw the rise of multinational banks, the automation of banking services, and the development of credit cards and electronic payment systems. The 21st Century the advent of the internet brought about the proliferation of online banking and digital currencies such as Bitcoin. The 2008 global financial crisis prompted renewed regulatory efforts such as the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010 in the United States, aimed at bolstering financial stability and consumer protection. But the 2008 financial crisis was never resolved, only delayed. And here we are now still kicking that can down the road. So now that you've got this context, let's discuss. How did banks work in the past and the era of the gold standard? The gold standard was a monetary system in which the value of a country's currency is directly linked to a fixed quantity of gold. So under this system, central banks committed to exchanging their currencies for a specific amount of gold upon demand, thereby ensuring the currency's stability and facilitating international trade. The origins of the gold standard can be traced back to the use of gold coins as a medium of exchange. Gradually, countries adopted the practice of issuing paper currency backed by gold reserves, allowing for the expansion of the money supply without the need for additional gold. By the late 19th century, the gold standard had gained widespread acceptance, and it was adopted by many countries, including the United States and Great Britain. However, the gold standard had inherent flaws. One of the primary reasons was its inflexibility in terms of economic crisis. Since the money supply was tied to gold reserves, it was difficult for governments to increase liquidity and stimulate economic growth during recessions or depressions. And this inflexibility ultimately contributed to the severity of the Great Depression in the 1930s. 
Additionally, the gold standard required countries to maintain large reserves to back their currency, which led to the hoarding of precious metals. The origins of the gold standard can be traced back to the use of gold coins as a medium of exchange. Gradually, countries adopted the practice of issuing paper currency backed by gold reserves, allowing for the expansion of the money supply without the need for additional gold. By the late 19th century, the gold standard had gained widespread acceptance, and it was adopted by many countries, including the United States and Great Britain. However, the gold standard had inherent flaws. One of the primary reasons was its inflexibility in terms of economic crisis. Since the money supply was tied to gold reserves, it was difficult for governments to increase liquidity and stimulate economic growth during recessions or depressions. And this inflexibility ultimately contributed to the severity of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Additionally, the gold standard required countries to maintain large reserves to back their currency, which led to the hoarding of precious metals. In the aftermath of World War II, the Bretton Woods agreed to establish a new international monetary system based on the US dollar, which was itself pegged to gold. However, this arrangement proved unsustainable as growing trade deficits and inflationary pressures forced the United States to abandon the gold convertibility of the dollar in 1971. This marked the end of the gold standard era and the beginning of the modern-day system, which uses fractional reserve banking. So fractional reserve banking is a financial system in which banks are required to hold only a fraction of their customers' deposits in reserve, while the remainder can be loaned out or invested. In some ways, it's the opposite of the gold standard. This practice forms the basis of modern banking, allowing banks to create credit and stimulate economic growth by facilitating lending and investment. If the growth of the money supply outpaces the growth in economic output, it can result in inflation eroding the purchasing power of money and potentially causing economic imbalances. Third, excessive risk-taking fractional reserve banking can encourage excessive risk-taking by banks as they seek to maximize profits through lending and investment. This can lead to the misallocation of resources and contribute to the formation of asset bubbles. In the event of a financial crisis, banks with high levels of risky loans and investments may face insolvency, necessitating government intervention or bailouts. So it appears that since 2008, we've all seen these things in action, and by the looks of things, it seems like the pain has only just begun. Now, let's explain the types of banks and services. So first up, we've got retail banks, also known as consumer banks. Retail banks primarily serve individual customers and small businesses. They offer a wide array of banking services, such as checking and savings accounts. Retail banks provide customers with deposit accounts that enable them to securely store their money while offering varying degrees of interest and accessibility. These banks extend various types of loans, including personal loans, auto loans, and mortgages, to help customers finance their needs and goals. The cash that is deposited by the customer is lent out to other customers at a higher rate of interest than the depositor is paid at the highest level. This is the process that keeps the economy humming. People deposit their money in banks. The bank then lends out the money for car loans, credit cards, mortgages, and business loans. The loan recipients spend the money they borrow.